I would like to welcome Mr. Lonnie Millers. Would you tell us about the careers you yeah. went through so far? <laughs> yeah, thank you. thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's nice being here tonight. And I'll share my screen here just to share the uh, uh, prepared remarks for everybody. So hopefully I am looking at a, uh, you are looking at a, a good screen with my presentation. If I could get confirmation that that is uh, a good visual for everybody. Definitely, yes. Thank you. All right. All right. So I, I, I titled this Breeding Credibility because it was kind of a basic, very foundational professional goal that I had when I started out in market research. And it was about being very credible. And I liked the quantitative aspects that I'll, I'll share because in a professional setting, and I hold it very closely for myself uh, personally, just always being very credible. <clears throat> so it's kind of a means to an end from a larger, you know, kind of life objective. But if I'm, I could uh, uh, advance here, let me just real briefly. So this is very much for those of you in the analytics space, for those of you who work with open source or enterprise software, SAS comes up quite a bit. We've been around for 46 years and all these other tiles of information that you can see, I, I won't read these to you, but we've been at the forefront of business analytics and creating uh, value for customers who can kind of self-serve, right? They have their own very robust teams that are doing analytical um, expert works and, and aptitude, but also we also do work for customers. They just don't hire the skills. They don't invest in the talent. So, you know, we're able to do things like uh, some of the things I'll, I'll walk you through here briefly. So if you haven't heard of SAS, uh, we're based out of Cary, North Carolina, just outside of Raleigh. I'm from Michigan, so I'm only recently three years out of the, the Detroit area. And uh, automotive is most of my background, so go figure, being in Detroit. So um, when I, I used to use SAS, actually, at the company that I'll, I'll mention uh, shortly after my career path. But I basically um, kind of look at our company in a couple different ways. We, we serve all industries and, and it's, it's really about analytics that's put into a production. It's not a lab experiment. It's something that's ultimately creating revenue or reducing costs. And I want all of you to really hold on to that point about the financials because that will be a closing point that I have. And in the examples here, we'll help the airlines identify where they've got risks for fuel uh, shortages for their next leg, and they can actually help optimize and override recommendations for fuel that uh, eventually keep travels, um, travel schedules on, on time. We will help people make sure we can identify failures with mechanical parts uh, with predictive maintenance. We do a lot where it's real-time tailored in the MarTech or in the marketing analytics or the customer insights or customer analytics. I'm giving you phrases that the industry uses. We'll play in that space as it relates to hotels, really catering to people very well. Um, we're really big, and this is a big area where analytics gets heavily consumed in the financial services in the broad category of fraud to make sure people aren't getting ripped off through anomalous uh, credit card transactions. And that gets into a lot of actual deep learning and um, pattern recognition that, that isn't far um, from, from, from imagination. And I'll just kind of advance through this, but you know, we'll help other city governments uh, identify where you may have learning uh, handicaps with your student population, uh, very important in a primary elementary uh, setting. And also we come alongside and our software can be used and is used around fraud and welfare fraud detection to kind of identify where there may be hardships unduly placed within families uh, based on their bringing folks up. Let me walk you through two real simple illustrations because I wanna balance the business and the math and the computational aspects of things. I come from the standpoint where in my role right now, I focus a lot where we're helping our sales team really make sure we're 
teasing out kind of the right problem statements, but also where do the applied analytics come from? So I want, I'll draw out a picture. I knew this, this is not based on an actual project, but this is incredibly realistic. So Kia, for example, much like you know, Ford has Sync and uh, uh, Stellantis has Uconnect or Hyundai has Blue Link. They have their telematics system. The cars give off information about the driver, the operations within. That information could be streamed and, and examined. Well, Kia happens to have this feature that they can actually, uh, you as the driver, the owner, you can schedule the climate control and it can just be an automated scheduling. So, you know, if you're in Michigan and after a couple minutes of driving, you want it to be at a comfortable 74 degrees without having to do something, that can be done. But those settings actually are a little clunky. And I say this not uh, out of disrespect, it's just how I research it. And I found out how would I do the commands to like get that automated climate control set up. So let's imagine analytics comes into play because I'm a product manager at Kia. And I want to find out because I'm realizing that that feature is not turned on a lot. It's really not being used. And it was a base option, or maybe it was a upsell with the trim level for that model of a Kia. So some of the insights, and one of the things, insights don't give you action and outcomes. Insights just get you to the next step. So you might want to know, like, what percentage of my customer base have this activated or not? What percentage of my customers might have a loyalty or a defection score already tied to them? You may want to know when is that feature being used? What part of the U.S. are they residing in? I might want to know what selling dealer, right? So I get all these other descriptive attributes that comes together the, that builds a golden record, if you will. And what I might want to be doing work-wise, right, fingers on the keyboard, I may just do some very simple comparative profiles because I segmented my Kia driver population. I might want to score their propensity with a logistic regression model or something along those lines to kind of see who's likely to favorably repurchase again. And I might want to do something around communicate. Um, how does this help the business? Well, from an action to take action, analytics should always lead to an action. It may help the next model year release because the user interface may be able to be improved. I don't have to go to the owner's manual. I don't have to hit six buttons. I might only hit one or two. So that's an informed decision on the UI. It may help the dealers get a notification from headquarters and say, hey, when you give John his car and he takes delivery, really spotlight that feature and make it known to them because it's a, it's a value add feature on the vehicle that, that we realize people are underutilizing. And it may also be a rules-based, kind of a Boolean logic, uh, complicated rule. They say, you know, we did the analysis and we're going to make a recommendation, dear dealers, or to the marketing agency or to the internal marketing communications team, they might say, hey, for people with a brand defection score that's more than 45%, we want to trigger an email that uh, turns on and hits their inbox uh, when the climate schedule is off after three trips, within their first 20 days, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can kind of imagine, based on data, a business action can take place. And who's this really benefiting, right? I could put dollars and cents to this. But the value is it may inform the model refresh and they may be able to earn a higher margin on the vehicles if it's a sought after. It helps them plan for demand on that feature because it does cost money to put those options into a car. It can influence the dealer, the blue, the legend, in terms of you know recommendations on orders. Now I know we're right now in the auto industry. Um, Supply is a precious thing right now. So how many dealers are doing custom orders for people walking into the showroom still? They're kind of taking what they can get, but you know, in normal times, let's just say. And I would mentioned it could help amplify the unique selling propositions from a marketing standpoint to the end customer or the fleet customer. Hey, look, this is a really cool feature. I appreciate this. It's kind of a mass, very approachable, affordable vehicle. And they have something like this in Uvo. I think that's pretty cool. That might drive you know, future um, retention. Last example, before I get into the career talk real quickly, simply to say drywall manufacturers use computer vision 
to kind of look to see without having to have a babysitter on the on the production line to see if the wall board is too close or too far because if it's too close or too far it actually bangs around and if you've worked with drywall that stuff chips and breaks and that's a problem you may structurally be okay but home depot if they're receiving shipment of it they don't want it likewise if there's a drip of a pipe overhead and i can get a computer uh, model the vision image recognition model to say that is a bad enough stain that that's a cosmetic quality defect. We need to get someone over there now, let alone find out why the water is dripping on it, but it's a bad quality perception that they want to inhibit. This is very real. I've seen this firsthand. And this is something that across other discrete manufacturers, and in this case, a drywall manufacturer is a it's a it's a it's a chemistry experiment it's 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 the right optimal ingredients and you've got to get the slurry and the mud in between two pieces of paper and it's got to be dried and kilned just long enough just right and they don't want to throw that away because that's scrap right so as i illustrate those business applications of analytics let me quickly run through what kind of got me to where i'm at um, as you guys heard, so I'm a Sparty and a Wolverine. I'm indifferent. Don't ask me who I root for. Um, but I, I, Big Ten, let's just say there. What I realized is I started out in computer science. I really appreciated the marketing aspect of items. So I switched computer science to marketing, but I had all the math and the computer science. And I really was drawn into statistics. I felt there was more of a niche there with a the marketing, marketing analytics and research. And I absolutely enjoyed uh, presenting. I'm enjoying this moment right now with all of you. When I got out of grad school, I went into market research and I realized I didn't enjoy the survey research part of life. It was boring. There's a joke that says, I'd rather eat the sausage than make the sausage. If any of you have ever had to build data from scratch, you know what I'm talking about. I frankly don't like it. So I've worked with a large database marketing company, R.L. Polk and Company out of Southfield, Michigan. They've since been bought. But I spent 21 years with them. I had a great progressive career from a senior analyst to a vice president. And I still was a kid in a candy store because of the compiled consumer demographic and vehicle data. I could sell with authority. I could actually tell a story to the media. I was the face and voice for a while. For, I was the leading US auto analyst. And so I was running forecast information. I was looking at customer retention data and we were making press releases, but we were doing things to help build credibility in the brand and to dovetail to the journalist community. And I was really enjoying professional services teams, consultants that were on site with our customers and helping run those organizations. I then still had a little bit of aspirations to stay with the marketing aspects of life. And I went into a product marketing role at 4 uh, they're, they're based out of Ann Arbor, where I was helping think about what the value propositions and what the go-to-market and the launch needs are of analytical customer experience solutions. I realized I'm done with marketing. I want to go back to my roots. I want to go back to those advisory services, which brought me to SAS almost seven years ago, where our industry consulting team sells alongside our enterprise sales teams. I use this phrase SPDI, same problem, different industry. And I think a lot of you will realize that or have realized that, that you can see a horizontal application of analytical problem solving. It just is a different problem statement, but those of us that cut across businesses get the benefit of seeing it in different shapes and forms, but it's the same end outcome and target objective that customers wanna have solved for them. And I felt for me, it's one of the best, and I would hold this dearly, continues to be one of the best blends or mashups of marketing and math and analytics and consulting all in one, you know, ball of yarn, if you will. So here's my, I really, and it's my last slide, I really hold strongly to these five items. They say networking, it's cliche, but I can't emphasize it enough. So many of you are looking at where's my job going to be, where's my network, where are other opportunities. Stay connected, and I'd actually put an accent on be available. 
meaning be available to volunteer for maybe work committees, be available to comment on someone's paper, be available to uh, perhaps weigh in on a, on a blog or a, or, a, or a LinkedIn article that one of your colleagues are thinking about doing. Help, you know, help critique that. Um, item number two, I speak from experience, whether I'm good or not, I'll you know, judge from the, my friends and network, but good people lose their jobs. However, I find people that have more quantitative, more niche, more salient domain expertise, they bounce back faster. I've seen it over and over. Um, item number three, character trumps knowledge. I believe this community represents incredible brain trust of domain expertise and technical orientation, but your character and how you carry yourself in business and in the eyes of customers or your internal, that will override all day long your technical capabilities or what you know about any methodologies or, or, the, sort, or the sort. This is my single biggest one, learn to talk financials. If you are an analytic practitioner and all you care about is the method or the how or the fascinating insights, but you don't, under, don't understand how it sticks to making money because my drywall gets a contract renewal with Home Depot or because my vehicles sell more because I've actually got a more eloquent in-vehicle experience, you're gonna be handicapped at some point in your career. Learn to talk where analytics drives revenue or drives costs down. So ultimately you're talking to a margin and the C-suite hears you in a different vein. And fifth, I do this all the time with every company, keep a brag list. Document your major achievements, use it in your next opportunity and interview cycle and what have you. Um, so those are just some of my takeaways and my learnings and motivations and I'll, I'll stop there. I would like to wake up Mr. Thomas Montgomery. Thank you, it's your turn. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, Oleg, thank you for the invitation um, today to, to, to speak. Um, so I'm actually on vacation right now. Um, today was a vacation day. I'm, I'm in Canada, um, not in the United States. And, and when I look up, I'm looking out at Lake Erie. So this is how much I care about this topic and how passionate I am. Normally I do these kinds of things one-on-one -on -one with a, or, or with a small group of, of mentees as a, as a mentor. So this is, this is especially fun to be able to, um, you know, talk to a larger audience. And it was, it was fun putting together the, um, this presentation. So, um, as, as just mentioned, you know, my, um, my, my bachelor's degree was in, was in physics, and, and I see that bachelor's degree as, as something that opened um, a lot of doors. Uh, there are fairly generic analytic doors that that, that degree opened, uh, but that was one of the reasons why I almost immediately went on and got a master's in computer engineering, because then that physics background I had, that analytics background that had some domain specialty like in electrical or um, uh, mechanical you know types of types of things maybe some um, solid state and things like that that I learned in physics well now I had the computer skills to actually make use of those analytic skills now um, like your president Oleg who invited me to you know to present today um, and and many others um, that I believe are on this call and, and hosting and, and so on. And uh, I did go one step further and, and, and get that PhD in, in computer engineering, uh, focusing on distributed AI. And it's, what's interesting is that degree opens some very unique doors, some very specialized doors. You know, if you want to teach at the college level, you really have to, absolutely have to have um, a, a doctor degree, um, like my parents did, and they were, they were both teachers. Um, now, when I, when I, as a hiring manager, am looking at people, uh, and I see somebody with a, with a bachelor's degree, a, a technical bachelor's degree, I think, okay, this is somebody who can, who can do a lot of good work. The master's degree, for me, means that this person is somebody who, um, um, uh, who has really kind of doubled down on a, on on that technology that they're that they're focused on? Um, they're really going to know it well, 
And as you know, a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking for people with experience. And you have this catch-22 of, well, how do I get experience if I can't get hired in the first place, um, you know, based on my bachelor's degree? Well, a master's degree can often solve those problems because that, that can, you know, kind of be a stand-in for, um, for experience. Now, personally, when I see somebody come and apply to a position with a PhD, I get excited because I know that I can give that person a problem where there's no guarantee that there's a solution. Um, we don't know if there's a solution and that individual is not going to blink. You know, they're going to, they're going to approach the problem. They're going to say, okay, let's get started. Um, let's, let's start breaking this big problem down into smaller pieces. Let's learn what we can um, and, and get going. Now, Lonnie, I, 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 I love your presentation. I, th I think a lot of what you said, I mean, resonates really well with, you know, with the way I look at things as well. The, the, um, same problem, um, different industry. I, I, I love that networking you'll see later and, and so on. Um, but, um, uh, and the financials I think is interesting too, because uh, now at this, at this stage, I think a lot of people think, you know, start asking the question of, well, um, should I get an MBA? You know, which, which is that, okay, I've really studied financial stuff. Now for me, somebody with an MBA and say a technical bachelor's, what's really interesting there is that you can then speak business in the world of contracts and finances and so on, and you can speak technical. So my wife is a great example of, of that combination. She's in purchasing at Ford. And so she can speak to the engineers who need to, who are specifying the parts we're trying to build and, and buy. Um, and she can speak the, the contract talk. And of course, the higher up you go, the more in any organization, the less your job is about doing analytics and the more it is about managing the finances and the resources around um, whatever the operation is. And, and, the, and, the, and the MBA can come in handy even for somebody with a PhD. Um, so, um, speaking of hiring people as a hiring manager, when I, um, when I look for that ideal data scientist to hire, I'm typically looking for three things. I want somebody with that analytics background, um, that can be a lot of different things. Obviously a degree in operations research is going to work real well, but any kind of engineering degree, um, uh, any hard science from physics to, um, to biology, mathematics, and, and so on, just somebody who's proven that they, they can, they can think analytically. Then domain knowledge is the next thing that I, that, that I look for that's important. Now that domain knowledge can be about the data. So if I'm talking about data coming off of a vehicle, if somebody knows the electrical architecture of the vehicle and can really understand the strengths and weaknesses of that data, uh, that's really helpful. But solving the, for the same problem, maybe the domain knowledge they have is about insurance or car sharing or quality or all these other things that you might use that connected vehicle data um, you know, to solve the business problem and, and bring the value that, you know, that, that Lonnie was talking about. So the domain knowledge can come in a, in a lot of different shapes. And then of course, skills. Um, as I mentioned, for me, it was the computer engineering that gave me the skills that I, that, that I needed. I'm often looking for people with programming skills or data skills. Just a few years ago, I was looking almost exclusively for people who had big data experience. That's um, Hadoop and Hive and, and tools like that. Now, fast forward just a few years, and now I'm looking for people with cloud experience that maybe know um, BigQuery within Google. My point is the skills that you need are always going to change over time, you know. Um, and of course, if you're if you're working in, in Ford Credit, and I and I know Alani has some experience with with Ford Credit, um, you know they're very much a SaaS shop. So there's a there's a whole suite of tools there as well. Um, now, ideal data scientists don't exist. So from my perspective, if I can get two out of three of those, I'm pretty happy. But I have one addition to this. 
you have to be good at communicating, at collaborating, at working with other people. If you can't do that, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are, how good your analytics are, it'll never bring value to the, to the company. It'll never see the light of day. So um, this to me is an ideal data scientist. Now, off into, you know, kind of a, a career for the, for the first time. Um, a lot of people look at the, look at the money. And in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a different tack than, than Lonnie did. The, how much are you going to be paid? Um, is, is often one of the big deciding points as to which company you go to. Um, now, the thing is that I believe that everybody on this call is going to be just fine financially through their career. If you're on this call, if you're, if you're part of Southeastern Michigan and forums, you are going to do just fine. As Lonnie said, you'll bounce back to another job. Uh, if, you know, if, if, if you just happen to be wrong, in the wrong seat at, at the wrong time. Um, what really is the bigger motivation for, um, you know, day to day, week after week, you know, keeping you going is the accomplishments that you're, that, that you're able to achieve through your career. Are you given the opportunity to continue to learn and to advance and what are you building? So when I started, um, started my working career, I worked in the, in the telecom industry. And uh, uh, it, at the time, it, um, I, I, I partly made that decision because they offered me more money than the auto industry did when I, when I was first coming out of school. But I was never really that excited about the end product. And I was a huge fan of Mustangs and stuff. And, and so, the next time I was in the, in the job market, um, I managed to let, land a job at, at Ford and I could be doing the exact same thing, but because I'm working for this iconic um, American uh, company that, you know, that builds products that I'm really excited about, um, um, there's a lot of reasons why I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm building and accomplishing there. Now, whenever I've seen anybody talk about their career, maybe they're towards the end of their career and they're retiring and giving giving words of advice, or um, uh, or or maybe they're you know in a mentoring situation or something. The overriding comment is always about the people. You're going to spend forty plus hours a, a week with with your co your coworkers. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's the most time you're going to spend, you know, kind of in your life with with anybody. You should enjoy the people you're, you're working with. You, um, um, you should recognize as well that if you can make the people around you um, successful, that will reflect back on you. Um, and, and, leadership will, will know that this is a good person if the people around them are always succeeding. Um, we were talking before the presentation start, started and, and uh, Lonnie and I had a, had a common friend, uh, Kevin Cooper. That was, that was one of the things I learned from working with Kevin. Um, make the people around you successful and it will re reflect well back on you. I think you should have a vision. Um, Clayton Christensen is, is well known for uh, the innovate, innovator's dilemma, um, but he also wrote this book about how will you measure your life. He's got some really interesting stories there. You know, he, he graduated with an MBA from, from Harvard and he and his, co um, and his fellow students were, um, they were gonna go change the world. And they were very excited about, um, about what they were going to do. He came back for a reunion and some of the people had just pursued money. And those people were typically on their second marriage and were very unhappy. And then you had other people that, you know, that, that stuck to principles and had this vision for where they wanted to be in the future and who they really were and what was important to them. Um, so I recommend that, that book. Now, as you know, I, I work for Ford Motor Company. I, Ford, like any large corporation has pluses and minuses, it's going to have its issues. But 
one of the things I love about Ford is that I, it, for a large corporation, I think it kind of has a soul. Um, you know, we have people like Bill Ford who, who really believe in trying to make the world a better place. Um, and another example is, is my dad. About 30 years ago, roughly, uh, he was retiring uh, from a career as a, uh, as a professor. And he was saying, he said during his retirement speech, if I had to do it over again, I would do the same thing. I would make the same choices. And I said, I want that. I want to be able to look back on that later in my life and, and be able to say the same thing. Recently, one of Ford's executives, Hao Tai Tang, announced his retirement and he started giving some words of advice. I read this as I was preparing this presentation. So I, I thought, wow, I really resonate with a lot of what he, what he said. He talked about learning is a, is a lifelong journey. Um, just because you're, you're graduating soon doesn't mean that you're done learning. And I also like this, his other point about power, that there are three sources. The first one is your position, but that really only matters to the people that report to you. The next is your personality. And if you have that, like your parents. But the most important power is the power of ideas because it's not finite. You can always learn more. You can, uh, you can present compelling vision and get other people to follow you, regardless of whether they report to you or not. If you can sell your ideas, that's going to be the difference between, as he puts, an effective leader and a smart, frustrated leader. Learn how to sell. So in one slide, um, I'm going to show you my entire, uh, uh, similar to Alani's. Um, uh, a lot of my early career was, was focused on text analytics. It was something that I picked up a few years into, um, into my career at Ford. Um, and what was cool about it was, um, similar to Lonnie, you know, um, same problem, different industry. Well, same problem, you know, different skill team within Ford. I worked with marketing, I, um, with our intellectual property attorneys, with human resources, with tech development, with manufacturing, you name it. I had skills that were of value and I could apply them to all sorts of different problems. So um, combine that with a curiosity of learning different parts of the business. Uh, and, and I had a really good run, a lot of fun. Um, somewhat more recently, I became more domain focused. Um, I, I got into um, the mobility and connectivity sides of Ford's business and, and, and worked on analytics there. Um, really leveraging all that data that's coming off of vehicles. And what was fun about it was at, um, for years, my dad would ask me, hey, you work at Ford, right? Show me something on the car that's yours. And I'd say, uh, you know, it's, I work behind the scenes. There's, I can't point at anything. And then ultimately I, um, with, with, this, with this work, I was able to pull out my phone and say, okay, see how in this app it tells you, um, you know, that you're going to need your oil changed in December or that you've got a slow tire leak. Well, that was mine. So for me, it was, it, that was really fun. And more recently, I've been more platform focused. So um, we're, we, we have something at Ford that we call Mach 1 ML. It's our tool suite for um, deploying, developing and deploying production grade AI and machine learning solutions. You know, it, um, it's fairly easy to do some experiments in, in AI and, and get some nice R squareds and so on, but building something that, that can actually be used in a production setting is a, is a different story. And uh, that's what we've been working on lately or what, you know, where, where, where my career has taken me lately. And, and again, the fun thing is that I, I, did, I now get to work with a lot of different people from all across the company who are, who are the customers of, our, um, of the platform that we're producing. So my last slide, um, uh, instead of a list that Lonnie, Lonnie had, I, I, I'm just going to hit that, that his, his first point. When I hired into to Ford in the, in the research labs, the vice president of research at the time used to always give this talk about um, going from I to T, from the individual to the team. He described hiring somebody into the research labs as a, as a rifle shot. You know, you, you found somebody with exactly the right technical knowledge to fill a niche, um, you know, that, that had to be solved. 
But that individual, after all those years of, of schooling, now has to has to become a team player and learn how to work with other with other people. Um, and that's the I to T. And and this this network that I drew just you know just have fun. This is how I got hired at Ford. Um, so you see me in the in the lower left corner and a couple of my colleagues from school and um, a faculty member who became the advisor on my dissertation or who who introduced me to a dean of one of the other colleges who knew the vice president at Ford who had a hiring manager that that I had met through a, a different colleague at, at school who had a, a spouse who was a librarian who who worked uh, for that dean and there's a wonderful network um, that I didn't even know existed until I started asking questions. Uh, it really helped me get my first job. So um, I'll end there and, and I guess short question time again, right?